Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Christina, and I'm here to talk to you about monetization. Okay, it's a dirty word with a lot of people, but I'll explain various principles and reasons how you can do it better. So uh, I want to structure today's uh, talk uh, going back to the roots of how monetization works, um, especially around IAP and some advertising, and then um, why certain mistakes happen. And I'll point to those most common mistakes uh, using the principles of monetization to explain those. And with the principles, then you can decide. You know, there are, the reason why monetization, monetization gets a dirty reputation is because there are some companies that exploit them. But if you understand the principle of monetization, which is neither good or bad, then you can decide for yourself how you can design in your game, make it better for your game. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, Second Sight. We are your virtual data analyst, and we help you turn your data into actions and understanding of your players so you can improve your game and make it more fun. Uh, my previous experience has included supercomputing at Microsoft, senior producer at PopCap, and I co-founded uh, Australia's independent uh, game publisher, and yeah, probably only one of few in Australia, uh, called Surprise Attack Games. So as I said, I want to go back to the roots. I want to go back to how monetization actually work. Okay, so the top top, top principle is charging money, charging any money inside a game is about perceived value. I'm going to break it down soon, but I just want you to really remember this sentence. And then I will explain individual part of it. So the very first mistake and most common mistake I see developers make is the items they're designing, they're trying to sell to customers, are not integrated into the game loop. Going back to the principle, it's perceived value. It is value. You are creating value for your customer. They have to see it's valuable for them to purchase. What happens with lot of developers is an afterthought. Uh, they chuck a couple of uh, cosmetic items, they make a shop, they put a cosmetic items in a shop, and they think that should work. Well, how do developers, how do customers find it? Why do they think it's valuable? Even if it's uh, cosmetic, why do they think it's valuable? So those things are never shown to the players during your game loop. And the most fundamental thing is you've got to show that value through your game loop. Give you an example. Of course, the most, I can't, Remember how many times I uninstalled this game <laughs> and then reinstalled it? Uh, uh, Clash Royale. It's one of the simplest monetization system. Very effective, but very, very simple. But what they do very, very well is completely integrating their items, what they want to sell, into the game loop. It's very clear that you play around a battle, which is their core game loop. Right? And the reward is chests. And chests are the ones they sell. Right? And waiting for chests is like side items, it's also the ones they sell. But it's very clear then you use the cards inside the chest and go back to make better battle. So the loop just continues and integrates directly the items they want to sell into the game loop. What it does is it shows value, it shows clear value. Okay, why do I need, there is no separate tutorial into why you need that item. Through play and through exploration, I understand certain epic cards are very useful. I understand certain chests give me more chance of epic cards. So they are all through the play, not another separate system. That's the most fundamental thing. So how do you design for it? I really like this uh, games brief. I refer back to it all the time. Uh, games brief uh, pyramid system. You can just go and search games brief 
uh, pyramid, you will find the same graph. So when you design a free-to-play game, right, think about it as three layers. The first layer is your core loop. They should be free. Everybody should be able to play it. Yeah, don't block them from that. Yeah, don't charge them for it. Everybody should earn enough uh, through in-game currency or other rewards, be able to play it forever. Okay. So this core game loop is in Clash Royale, the battle itself. So if you, if you are good enough with the game, you can keep playing Clash Royale, and if you're patient enough, of course. But the second part is the metagame. That's where monetization actually lives. Okay, metagame is where you actually monetize, not the core loop. Okay, so the core loop is where you show value. And then the second part, retention game, is retention and metagame. Uh, what I mean by metagame is obviously um, the core loop is one puzzle, for example, one puzzle round. And the uh, retention, the metagame, is leveling up, leveling up, leveling up, the difficulty curve, and how you clearly show your players the goal, what can you get to. Um, in Clash Royale, it will be lots of arena you can keep getting to, and there will be also super fan game, which I'll talk about next. But that's the retention part, that's the metagame part. And that's where you can decide what you choose to sell. Okay, you can choose to sell things to help players going faster. You can choose to sell things to uh, show off players' characters or help them upgrading. You can choose uh, to create additional value, which is the hardest actually in monetization. Create additional value, so showing them having a slightly different type of experience if they pay. Okay, so that's actually the top level rather than restricting players. Uh, experience uh, and uh, monetize by removing that restriction, you are giving them another experience. Um, so that's hardest to design and very rarely use, but that helps retention a lot. But retention in metagame is where monetization actually lives. The last bit, after all those two layers work, then you think about your super fan game. Free to play games only monetize, you probably all know that, only monetizes between 2 to 5% of players. And there is 28 rule, so 20% of those paying players will give you 80% of revenue, roughly. They're usually even more, you know, maybe 90% of your revenue. And so, where those super players come from, that's a super fan layer. Okay, so that's where you have tournament, leaderboard, clan. Uh, 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 where people can compete, where people can, you know, really be the best at your game. But that doesn't happen if you don't have the bottom two layers, right? If the bottom two layers are not fun enough, there is no super fan. So the number one rule is, again, being fun about your bottom two layers. In other words, you're showing customers value. So the super fan game is where you have continuous monetization and you have high level tier to uh, monetize those super fan players. So in other words, monetization design is your game design. There is no separate monetization design. Okay, it's your game design. You should take those steps and when you first think about your core loop, what you need to think about is how expendable it is, right? How much modifiers I can add onto my court loop so that different players may have slightly different experience using this item versus using another item. Uh, my favorite game genre is tower defense, right? And it's very easy to see <laughs> like how many different types of experience you can create for players. I can go through the same level by using different type of roles in a tower defense players, right? And that's expansion. That then the natural next extension is how do you modify those roles, right? So that's your core game. You think about expansion. The next bit is your retention game, your meta, your meta game loop. Then you start thinking about your basic monetization. That's a part where players at least will give you the first time purchase. And ideally it happen within the first week. Okay, so they will make the first purchase. And that's where, because you show them value through, through core loop, you can go level three or level four, 
which will be a little bit harder than rest because it is your difficulty level needs to spike a little bit harder at a certain point. You can't always be very simple. Maybe that's where they need a bit of help. Maybe that's where I'm selling my items. And that's where you can also explore your players, of course. But you have to think about those. What can you do here to help them achieve a better experience? And then you go on to your design your super fan game. That's where you think about how can I make items continuous monetizable. It has to be continuous and it has to be high end items. Your super fan, your super fan players can use. OK, so you can't just have one type of item. You don't have multiple. And within one type, you have you got to have multiple tiers. And I'll talk about those a little bit later, the multiple tiers. But once you go through these three stages, then you think about your currency, you just think about your price and you think about shop. By the way, shop, shops are really where you actually sell. Uh, a lot of people think shop is where you sell. In reality, where you sell is where the value is most apparent, okay, where they need it most. Okay, so very often you see why a lot of puzzle games at the beginning of level, they will give you different types of items, right? And it's usually adjusted to that level specifically. And because they know that's where you need the most. Okay, that's not, they're not leading you to shop. They're giving it to you right there. So that's where you can start thinking about where you sell them. So I use shop as a generalization of where you sell them, but you have to think about it all along the way. So mistake number two, and I see again and again, you charge way too low in the game. And the reason being, again, perceived value. Go back to the principle, perceived value. Very often what I hear is what developers, how developers value their items is like this. I spent three months and so much effort on this piece of content, and I only spent two days on this sword. Okay, of course I'll price uh, this piece of content way more, 10 times more than this piece of sword. They use effort, they use what they think is good content to, to charge, okay? But that's the value to your mind. It's not perceived value to the customers, to the players, okay? So what is perceived value to the players? There are a lot of immediacy effect I don't care about a content I can only play three weeks later. I care about most what I need to do to get through this level. So maybe that piece of saw you only took like one day to finish worth a lot more to me now than you know, a piece of content three weeks later. So very often developers think in the mindset of how much effort instead of going, okay, this is what customer value most. That's where I need to charge more or less for this to create tiers. So the number of factors playing to that value, I can't go through all of them, um, but um, there are a lot of books around it as well. So you gotta think about value comparison isn't rational. It tends to be irrational. It tends to be driven by emotion, tend to be driven by immediacy effect. There are a lot of things affecting it. But you gotta think the top point I wanna make here, you gotta think from player point of view, what valuable to them rather than you. So because of that, a lot of people also price their stuff based on, I see another game charge this much. And I'm nowhere as good as that game. You know, like my, my game isn't as polished and blah, blah, blah. So I can't charge that much. You know, like similar around, a similar type of item. I can't charge that much. Okay. Again, it works in an open market. Yes, definitely. It works like this. If you compare item one from this game A directly item two from this game B. Yes. That's, that's how it works. It's compared side to by side. And the customer will go, no, no, that's way too expensive. But understand, your game as a market is an exclusive market. There is nobody else competing in your game. Nobody else. The only competing factor is how much interest, how much fun players find your game. 
years. So the only comparison they're going to make is, well, this is more expensive, but I want to make sure this gives me more, more value. You know, I can show off or I, I use this, this gives me three times effect or whatever. That's what they judge it on. They're not judging it on, okay, this is similar to another game and I need to compare to another game. That's not how it works. Your market is exclusive, remember that. So don't be afraid to charge above $2 for certain items and don't be afraid to go and compare with another game and go, oh, that's why it's not worth as much. Create enough, create enough value for your customers and you can't charge that much. So that goes to my mistake number three, not enough item tiers to suit different players. Again, going back to the value system, right? So uh, as I said, you know, 80% of players, 20% uh, players give you 80% of revenue. Um, so what happens is the item tiers need to cater for different customer groups. Free to, free to play works by so-called price discrimination. That's why it works. It doesn't work in other, other means. Think about it, two to 5% of people convert. Two to five. It's very few, okay? Few of those people actually convert. But because you can charge them differently, that's why it works. So price discrimination is a concept about, uh, I'll be, I can charge differently to different group of customer based on, uh, even though the, the items, the product is similar in nature. Very good example is coffee, right? Because I think it's Melbourne. Um, so coffee is a very good example. So like if you a coffee nut, right? You will pay over $5, $6 for a cup of coffee. For me, coffee is functional to me. Right? I'm, not, I'm not the type of person who go out away, wait for half an hour, that costs me money as well, <laughs> to, to drink a cup of coffee, right? So I would rather pay $3. So if you can go into a supermarket, you can clearly see price discrimination works. And they work by showing you, they patch it up. Yes, you can argue there is definitely quality difference, but that, would that quality difference worse double the price? Maybe not. But they package it differently to appeal different group of people. Because if I really want this rare, uh, coffee bean that comes from a specific place, I would be willing to pay more. And this should be similar things in a game. You need price discrimination work for you. Very easy to see a good example is Lao, right? So why is a skin, is a piece of digital skin? Why does it price differently? Because it's a perceived cool factor. You know, like, well, um, Clearly, the first two isn't as cool as the last one. <laughs> you know, so like I'm like, uh, yeah, this is yeah, this is probably worth more to me. And they allow it's integrating the game loop because my character clearly shows off the new skin. Not many people have that skin. That's a rare factor for me. So that's value to me. Okay, but in the end, they are all probably cost. Uh, 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 cost the uh, developer the same amount of time to create, you know? <laughs> but they create a tiers to give you perceived differences in value. And you do need that in order to achieve that two to five percent of players that enable, to, enable you to fund your game. So, too generous with the in-app currency, absolutely. Again and again, I see that problem happening. I'll, I'll also go into that uh, later. There are a lot of data showing that developers consistently being overcautious um, of their monetization, overly cautious. Um, but that's the next point I'll go into. But again, one thing about the attitude of being too generous with in-app currency is again the feeling maybe my item isn't worth as much as another game, right? My, maybe uh, I'm going to block, another common reason I heard, maybe I'm going to block players from proceeding. 
So if you designed a way, like I said, the core loop, the most fundamental experience should be free for all. You should not have that much concern that maybe I'm blocking people from proceeding. You shouldn't block people because you lose retention. Retention is the single most important metric in free-to-play games. You lose retention. You shouldn't block people. But you should give them additional value, additional experience as a second tier of experience. Then you become feel more confident that you can charge people. You don't have to keep giving them currency in order to lure them, keep going, because you clearly show that if you pay, they're a lot better experience for you. So I want to go into the number two monetization rule, because this is so common. And there's a continuous, I want to get you to see, uh, and we see that all the time as a data company, that there is no correlation a lot of times between being overly cautious and your retention and engagement. So mistake number five is overly cautious with frequency of ads. So this is recent research Delta DNA did. And they have over, I think, 280 examples in this particular survey. Uh, so they still found majority in this 2016, like last year, they still found majority of developers only serving one ad, if they do ads, only serve one ad or fewer per session. That's very, very few. Um, and very few players, uh, very, few, um, very few developers actually manage to segment players and target them differently. And still lots of uh, developers don't serve ad at all. But what's more, interest, what's more interesting is the professor from a, a University of San Francisco looked at all the Delta DNA data. Uh, the Delta DNA is an analytic tool platform. Uh, so they looked at the data and go, there is no evidence of first session ad frequency uh, affecting re re uh, retention. Again, the single most significant predictor is your game. It's, it's as simple as that. Your attention depends on your game, how, how much fun it is. So free-to-play game is like, it doesn't hide behind marketing. It doesn't hide behind a poster to attract people to purchase. It goes out, people play it, and if your game simply isn't fun, people will stop playing it. As simple as that, before they monetize. So there is no evidence of the data linking to that. And we still see that ads not being shown nearly frequently enough. And this one of the reason is there is a concern of game experience, which is understandable. So uh, uh, in the same survey, they asked the attendees, right? Uh, they, they asked the survey respondents, why is it that uh, you're not you know, serving more ads? You know, it's, it's quite long, you know, 2016, and ads have been, been in existence for a long time. So most, the biggest answer, the majority two categories is concerned with engagement and retention drop off. And which is a valid concern because you are worried. And the reason is also being there are vocal minority in review comments as well. There are people who say in review comments, no, you're showing way too many ads. I'm going to stop playing the game. Yes, definitely. But without being data informed, you actually don't understand they are actually vocal minority. They might not be the majority of your players because people who are happy with your, uh, with your game, unless they're very, very happy, they, they leave a comment. But in general, they are just okay. They don't leave a comment. They don't go and say to you, I love your ads, please show them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> now, they don't say that, but they are naturally okay with it, especially you use rewarded video that leads them you know, into progressing further. However, I need to, cautious you against, you know, so if you use both IAP and ads, which is most effective way, there is a cannibalization of IAP with ads, especially with rewarded video, if you don't understand how to balance them and you don't use data at all. So uh, I only highlighted the iOS, the same research survey results. By the way, that survey is free to download, so you can go and download it. 
Uh, so it's in the same survey results, they compare groups of games that with no ads with groups of games that with rewarded ads and you know, interstitials. And interstitial can be ignored, to be honest, because most games nowadays do very few interstitials, but there are places for interstitial. I can talk about it a little later. But rewarded ads, as you can see, on average is less uh, with AppDale. Average revenue per user uh, per day uh, is less than no ads at all. So you've got to understand, okay, so IAP is about value, which I talked about before, right? So IAP keeps players in your game, right? Because the more value they get from your game and they purchased, the more they want to keep being your game. So it's a positive loop. Using ads is a very good complementary way to your monetization, but it takes, potentially takes players away from your game because you're advertising other games that are potentially similar to yours in your game, especially with rewarded ads, uh, rewarded video. Because a video network nowadays is trying to optimize for relevancy, right? So if you are a strategy game, they will try to get strategy, a similar types of game to advertise in your game so that they can achieve higher click-through rate. That's why they exist, you know? So potentially, you know, first of all, you might lose taking, you know, players going away from your game to another game. First of all, with video ads. And second of all, that it cannibalizes uh, IAP in a way because you're giving them more in-game in currency. So when, when you use this combination of strategy, which I encourage you do, uh, you got to think about that. You got to understand there is certain cannibalization happening. But IAP is way harder than ads to, you know, design. So uh, there is definitely a trade-off there. So what does data-informed monetization actually look like? So one, the, only, the other reason why people are over cautious, like I said, is because they don't, they don't know what the majority of players actually want you know they don't know that if they put this in they increase frequency of ads let's say in the first session is it going to impact my retention or engagement they don't know and that's why they're overly cautious which is fine you if you don't know you would be overly cautious but once if you start understanding you can understand all those factors in your game all the time for example you know your health metrics all the time and that's easy to get you know <laughs> With most analytic tools, it's actually easy to get. If you monitor your key metrics all the time, you understand when you roll out an update, whether it's negatively or positively impact your, your metrics. A lot of time, actually, when you release an IAP, instead of impacting your retention, it goes up. Because it gives another way for player to experience on the side of your game. So it goes up. The retention, especially longer term retention, goes up. So you monitor your metrics all the time. And then you can experiment with different frequency, different pricing, different placement. That's all the things you can experiment with, with the certainty that if anything drops, if any of the health measures drop, you can roll it back. You can do it quickly. And of course, I would advise A-B testing, where you randomly test one group, you know, two groups of people at the same time comparing to a control group. But ultimately, what you want to do eventually, which is the high end, you know, the later part uh, in your strategy, which is much harder to do, but eventually, in order to realize free to play price discrimination and looking at different group of players differently, not everybody is the same, that doesn't exist anymore, one flat price doesn't work for everybody, you should target them differently. You can target paying players like with different tiers of items. Ultimately, that's where we want to get at. Okay, you can segment them, you can understand who they are and target them differently. If it's engaged but non-paying players, reward it, video, because that keeps them playing. And retained players are very good because they bring in other players and they talk about your game. Free players is fine, they're very good. Keep them playing. Uh, Non-engaged and non-paying players Sometimes you use interstitial, uh, you use other method 
to uh, target them, but really depends on how you want to design your game experience. A lot of the time, you know, interstitial doesn't necessarily fit with your game experience or banner ads. That's why very rarely you see people use them. But rewarded video, by the way, uh, I see a lot of time rewarded video, they just chuck it in, developer chuck it in, go, I'm going to reward people with currency. Again, you need an IAP system to support that because you reward them currency, why do they value that currency? They need to get something for that currency. So again, it goes back to the items. If I don't value those currency, then I wouldn't watch your video. Why would I? I wouldn't press on that button. As you know, rewarded video is me actually plus, you know, click on the button actively instead of passively being shown a video. I need to see the value goes back to the number one principle. You've got to understand what customers' perceived values are. So I want to end with the last words of, you know, like, when you design IAP, right, and, and I want to make sure I leave enough time because I want really lots of questions because there are a lot of things I'm not, I'm not able to cover in this short talk, but I want to leave, leave time for questions as well. So when you're designing IAP, you think about creating value, you think about different tiers, you think about uh, when you're designing the items, it has to be in your game loop. Secondly, when you place your ads, you think about the frequency, you think about your natural tendency of being overly cautious, okay? And think about using data to inform your decision and think about how you can inter integrate it into your gaming experience better. Then in the end, if you have enough framework to support yourself to make the decision, you don't have to be overly cautious. Okay, um, any questions? Yeah, please. I've got two questions. Yes, please. Yeah. And I think it can apply to a lot of different things, not just free to play games, but that's right. Um, how do you determine the amount to charge? Yeah. Because uh, you said obviously you can get to charge a minimum. Yes. The, the other spectrum where you can go way too high and just scare people off with this massive amount of. Right. There are way, uh, okay, let me go back to this sh sh uh, screen of, um, okay, so. You, everybody been to a supermarket, right? So there are a lot of concepts you can borrow from retail. There are several ways to test that. Uh, ultimately, it's a test as well, okay? There is no right answer for every single game. You gotta find what your customer comfortable with. In general, what you do when you go out the door, you will have at least three tiers because what tend to happen is people tend to buy the middle tier, especially in comparison of three. Okay, so you got to make sure your middle tier is as le uh, at least high enough. Okay, um, and then so so your high tier needs to be you know uh, two three times higher. It shouldn't be so much lower because you uh, you follow roughly this curve or power curve, roughly that power curve. Okay, another way borrowing from supermarket placement is the more conveniently placed is where people tend to buy first as well. There is a, a parallel, um, so lots of concept is borrowed from behavioral economics, by the way. So if you want to understand how items are sold, read behavioral economics. Uh, so a lot of ways um, uh, 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 games are sold, oh, sorry, items are sold people is by most valued, like they put conveniently, the, in the top position, uh, most popular, most val highest value, a package, for example. So what you can do is first using a package to test price points. And when you test, you always go from high because you can always come down. You can't go back up. It's very hard to go back up unless you release new items. You can go back up, but release new items. So you can come down. So you can use packages to start understanding price point because package is discounted, which means you can always go back up in that way. 
So you can start testing pricing points using that and start putting what you want to test to the convenient place in the shop. So there are many, many ways to test what the optimum price point is. And eventually you'll get there. You always use a preset, uh, uh, roughly follow the curve, uh, but eventually you'll find uh, with data the right pricing point. Yeah. Um, yeah, one question, sorry. Sure. Yes, <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the very first one is, is it integrate, like I said, is it integrating to a game loop? <laughs> it has to be integrating into a game loop. You can look at the frequency. You don't only give them one item, so you always give them multiple. So when, uh, when I do first launch, uh, soft launch, right, I don't tend to uh, test the depths of items, meaning that if it's one type of items, I, you know, five of them is enough. It's not for me to test the depths. It's for me to test the categories, right? Some category might be make it faster. Some category may be increasing your skill. Some category is maybe uh, giving you different way of playing the game. I want to test which one is the most uh, uh, bought. So that's how you figure out what your group of customers value. Because for different genre and different type of game, they often value different things. Uh, and because different genre attract different type of players as well. Um, there are certain games definitely not suited to free to play. I don't think you, you should even think about it. But um, especially if you can't continue to monetize, it will be very hard because one-time monetization doesn't work with free-to-play at all. You have to have continuous monetization because, again, the 80-20 rule, you don't have continuous monetization, you can't get your ceiling high enough. So, um, so that's a one, one way of testing, but that's only for your middle, the, if you look at a pyramid, the middle part. Uh, this one, the middle part. That's when you test first purchase. The continuous monetization is different. Um, it's very hard for me to get into that now, but the continuous monetization is where you start testing. Uh, it has to be done after all of the basic metrics are good. Then you start seeing whether you have a depth. Um, very often in analytical, if you ever see an analytical, it's shown by LTV, LTV curve. And that's where the continuous monetization curve. And you can look at whether you have depths of monetization. So create item first, test categories of item, then test depths of items. OK. Yes? Um, what data do you most commonly use to when segmenting customers? So the most common segmentation used by nearly everybody, uh, uh, like uh, all the uh, uh, data informed studio, is always paying non-paying. That's the most, most, most common. But under non-paying, you should also segment by uh, engagement metrics, such as you know, how frequent the sessions are for those players and how long they play in those sessions. Those three categories of uh, metrics are commonly available everywhere. Uh, it's just a way to read them and segment them. So um, those to non-paying players, if you can segment into uh, the top 20-30% most engaged customers, then you should be able to offer them more rewarded video. Okay, while the bottom, like, you know, 20-30% of players, uh, one suggestion to monetize those group of players is tend to show interstitial earlier. Uh, but like you got to, uh, the hard bit isn't segmentation. The hard bit is how you can uh, change your game differently based on different group of customers. Yeah. I have an interesting follow up to this. Is, um, yeah. How long do you wait before you segment those customers and pay them on pay? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, there is no point getting to segmentation if your core game isn't, like uh, the health metrics, the core health metrics isn't stable. There's no point getting into it because you're just not going to make it. So I would, I would get, again, using this pre pyramid, I will make sure my free loop is fine enough 
that's measured by retention engagement, okay? My retention, my first purchase is happening, that's measured by purchasing players, whether my first purchase is happening uh, between, like, you. Um, by the way, used to be my rule of thumb is uh, first, purchase, first purchase should happen within first three days in order for your monetization to happen. Nowadays, the data shows that the later, you know, it should probably within seven days. The reason is later pay, paying users actually more engaged and they stay longer. <laughs> So the, because they, they completely made an informed decision by that point. Okay, so, so they, they, are, they are a lot more engaged. I think previously the data is too short-term focused and now uh, we start using data that are a lot longer-term focused. So we start detecting that actually people who pay a little bit later. So my rule of thumb has changed to seven days. Within seven days, people should pay. At least first purchase should happen. Um, yeah, so, so without these first two layers, as I said, don't worry about segmenting. And that's the last step for you to segment. Yeah. And then you can start increasing uh, the percentage of players, uh, increasing the monetization of different group of players. Yes. Any other question? Oh, yes. Yeah, so um, I do not think free-to-play works by uh, um, grouping a lot of customers, you know, and then monetizing two to five percent, right? So the ability for one game to amass a lot of players is getting is diminishing because of the competition, right? So I do not think free-to-play will work the same way uh, uh, in the future. I think there will be a myriad of monetization we're going to start seeing. There will still be fundamentally based on the value principle, okay? Like that's why I want to put that out there, like drill it in. <laughs> like if you go away thinking of nothing else is about value, okay? It's still based on value. For example, subscription layer is very frequently, and App Store is pushing it, very frequently being uh, taunted by people saying that's the next version. Subscription is, but think about subscription. You got to continuously push out content, right? If you can't do that, you can't do subscription. Because subscription, pay, paying subscription means I value your continuous content. I value things you continuously give it to me. If your team are not able to keep up the content, you can't do subscription. So that's going to limit your options of free to play. And you start seeing annuity, which we've been discussing, Laura and I have been, been discussing this as well. Again, that's a, a, a monetization model where you, uh, it's similar to, you, you probably know daily reward before. Have you all heard about daily reward? So you log in, you get uh, like more and more reward every single consecutive day, okay? So the reverse of that is if you want to, the annual trade model is if you want to uh, buy now, it, it appeals to immediacy effect. That's behavioral economics immediacy effect. If you don't want to buy now, I give you 50% discount. Uh, and then you start getting items every single day for the rest of month, let's say. You pay 50% 50, 50, uh, 50 discount to get it now, <laughs> all right? And the genius is, I give you over 30 days. So you come and you come back every single day to discuss, uh, to discover new things in the game and to play new things. But nobody's going to pay for it until they realize that 50% discount is a steal, right? So it goes back to value, it goes back to how much you show them you have higher end items that's, you know, uh, much more expensive than that. But if you use 50% discount, it's very good for you right now. So the, the couple of things that uh, I see the trend being not trying to amass as much players as possible because it's getting more and more difficult, but keeping players for the longer term and start monetizing, uh, try to first increasing number of players monetizable. That's why the advertising model is a lot more prevalent. Uh, and secondly, if you are really my loyal players, 
I have more options to monetize. Um, so, so this too, you can, that's why there are different monetization model at the annual T, the subscriptions, it's all people who already would be willing to pay. Um, uh, so I see those two trends are going forward. I don't see a reversal, especially in App Store, going back to premium. The reason being content and entertainment is already set in the mind. Uh, it, I actually see more and more PC will go free to play. The reason being content and entertainment and is inter interchangeable. I don't need it. You know, it's not functional. Think about Netflix. Think about, you know, like uh, uh, um, all the music platform you can stream music. You pay them a subscription. You don't pay individual, you know, music anymore, right? So because content is interchangeable, what can you charge? You charge for personalized experience. You charge for additional experience in my game if you're interested in it. That's why I don't think there will be a huge reversal back to premium because the next generation and what we see now is entertainment or content itself isn't worth a lot of much money anymore. Um, unless you are branded. Branded is a completely different discussion. Yeah, sorry, you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you said before that you uh, wanted people to make the mistake of not offering enough tiers yeah. for players. Is there a knockable number and is there such thing as like too many tiers and like choice paralyzation? Yeah, choice, uh, yeah. Uh, so the tiers itself is no problem, right? It's too many items that are similar to each other. It's a confusing place. <laughs> Right, so so uh, a lot of time it cuts down, but you still should have a lot of items. But the cuts down to to cater for that choice, uh, paralyze is show at the relevant time, owning a couple of selected items. Show at the beginning, the most popular, like I said. Um, change your store layout by showing three. Usually, uh, it's very popular. Two or three at one screen. Okay, you can see most games do that nowadays. It all narrows down to uh, gearing players towards uh, a certain items, uh, certain uh, IAP. But like I said, you still got to have depths of monetization, which means you either have lots of items. It's not necessarily tiers, just lot, lots of items. Uh, like, you, like you saw in uh, uh, Lao's example, their tiers really is three or four tiers. Their pricing tiers are not that many, but they will keep releasing skill, uh, uh, skins in that particular tier. So um, you just, the depth of monetization comes from more items as well as re reusable items, uh, what we call a consumable. So that, you know, like the same item, uh, like a power up, the same one can be used again, and again, and again. You know, so that's where the depth monetization come from. Yeah, cool. Any other questions? Yes. For the metrics you showed for ad versus no ads. Yeah. Um, do you attribute the difference in retention to uh, the ads retaining non-paying players? So um, this particular one doesn't have, unfortunately, it doesn't have retention figure. It's very, it, by the way, this data, um, so as you can see, the uh, rewarded video clearly has better retention because lots of data does show that. However, keep in mind, these are group to group comparisons. So in terms of data, it's not as accurate as, you know, the same game before and after comparison, okay? But, you know, as a data platform, uh, you know, you can't control that. So that's why they, they compare group and poor group. If your example is big enough, it's, it's very similar, you know, that's fine. Um, and I don't know whether they measure in terms of the genre as well, because different genre will be different. Um, but rewarded videos, what tend to happen is it does keep increasing your retention, but it cannibalize your monetization. That's what tends to happen. Yeah, so that's why you saw it. Actually on Android, if you notice, it's a lot lower. <laughs> lot lower. If you reward a video, you have a lot lower uh, IAP. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have time for two more questions, I think. Yeah. You, you, you one more? Segmenting oh, we need to go. Yeah. So, Just one more then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Segmenting users and then separating them by like paid and not paid. Yeah. Are you showing ads to paid users? Paid 
It's a very good question. I will not. Yes, especially high paying. I so will not. What happens, like, I guess, when users, obviously, they talk on forums, the most engaged ones, they're like, hey, I can get free items by watching out, versus your friend who spent $100 and got all the, all the gear. Yeah, so there's a very common thing. You know, like, there's a very common item to say, you know, you buy this. Uh, there are several ways of getting around this. The common items, you buy this, you remove ads. Okay, the other way is you have rewarded video there, but you reduce frequency. You reduce frequency. Because reward, again, reward video is clicking on it. So, so they, they, most paying players, I, I can tell you, in China, for example, where I worked for a long time, there will be people who pay thousands of dollars for a game per month. Okay, they wouldn't care about clicking on an ad to get a few dollars. You know, they wouldn't care. So when they pay that high, they don't really care what other people say. <laughs> yes, and, and they're very, very engaged. And they're, <laughs> I'll give you, oh, like, I don't have time, but it's, uh, it's, you really can't, like, you gotta get into your player's mind. Your players think significantly different to developers, yeah. Okay, I think that's it, right? Is that it? Okay. Right, that's it, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>